games is incredibly hard but really rewarding. New game ideas are either totally unique and original, or might be based on a franchise or an existing game as a sequel. It can take several people to several thousand people, a few months to a few years to make a great game. The game team usually consists of a creative director, producers, game designers, artists, engineers, audio directors. People do so many different jobs when it comes to making a game and making it great. In the beginning, the team's got to come up with a great idea. While that sounds easy, it's really hard to come up with just an amazing game that's new, unique, and original. Something that's going to sell, something that's not you know too different or too weird or too strange, but something that people are going to really gravitate towards and really want to play. So that team has to start with an idea, has to start with a concept, has to work on that idea, work it out on paper, prototype it, you know, try to figure out what's special about it, right? Those can take a really long time, really, really just nail it, just get every little aspect of that game right, you know, before they move on to really fully build the game in production. The vision for the game is usually held by the creative director. The creative director kind of comes up with all the original ideas with his team. But he's the one that guides and shepherds it, kind of like a movie director. He's the one that comes up and helps with the story and the visuals and all aspects of the game and why it's fun and how it all comes together before you go in and build it. You're going to figure out how much it's going to cost to build, how long it's going to take. Can you even do it with the tools and the technology you have? The job of a creative director is really hard but really, really fun, and it's something that every game designer someday usually hopes to become. A system designer is the person who puts together minute-to-minute -to -minute gameplay. That starts with an on-paper design, figuring out how you're gonna move and fight, and all the little things you're gonna do every second of the game as you're playing it. Then they're gonna figure out how to implement that into your game engine, how to make that fun, how to make it balanced, and how to make it really rewarding. So the system designer is responsible for the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay within a video game. Level designer is kind of part artist, part game designer, part engineer. There's somebody that has to put together the whole vision for where is the game going to be? What's that world like? How's it all come together? And how's that fun? Where are the enemies at in the world? Where are the quests or the missions and all the things that you do? So they're really in charge of kind of that long term, usually one area of a game, how it all comes together. They're using those systems that the system designer helps build and they're using it into a bigger context to figure out how is this all going to come together? They got to make it come together really great to make it look good and play fun. Here's an example of how you work as a team to put together a whole new level. We're gonna take a level, we're gonna modify it, we're gonna come up with a new idea for how to make it better, and we're gonna pass it back and forth and back and forth many different times. This isn't just a one man you know, coming up with something and implementing it. This is about a team working together and trying to figure out how to solve a problem. So Scott, over to you. Thanks, Troy. So what we're looking at here is actually a small science fiction action shooter project that we've been working on. And you'll see that from the outside, the space station doesn't really look like a space station at all. And that's because when you're playing, you never really see it from this perspective. You never see the outside of it at all. And so there's no particular reason for us to make it look like a space station. What we're going to look at here is the first encounter that the player is likely to have when they start the level. If we go through this door, this is the, the only door you can get through at the beginning of the level. We go through here, and this door is pretty much right in your face when you, when you come through. And if we step inside, you'll see, oh yeah, there's a bad guy here waiting for you. Uh, and one of the things we've been talking about is maybe amping this up a little bit because we want this first encounter to be something that really kind of shocks the player. So we've been talking about adding uh, at least one more enemy. So I'm going to select this guy and I'm gonna drag him off. And now we've got two bad guys. And in fact, you know what? We're gonna go to three. We really want this to be kind of an intense moment. So now we've got three enemies here and we're gonna run the level and see how it goes. Okay, so here we are running the level and oh yeah, the first thing you're gonna run into is a weapon. So we're gonna pick that up and see this is kind of a Star Wars looking block. Uh, so we're going to run over here, we're going to go through this door, and we're going to step into the, oh yeah, wait a minute, okay, this might have been a bad idea, oh, and I'm dead. Well, that didn't really go very well, but at the same time, we want this to be a pretty intense uh, moment, so instead of just dialing back the number of bad guys, I think what we're going to do is proceed on something we've been talking about for a while now. We're going to give you a little companion. And that companion is mainly to give you some early warning in the event that there's danger nearby. So Alex, uh, let's go ahead and move forward on, the, on that robot we talked about. 
get it built and animated and we'll put it in the level and see how it how it plays thanks scott in foundations we structure the course in two parts animation and modeling both tracks teach the basic concepts and eventually these lead to more advanced areas like visual effects, game design, modeling, animation, and even virtual productions. The foundations are an essential basis to any field within the production environment. So Scott, building a companion robot is a great idea. This will surely enhance gameplay. Now let's start the process of modeling. So we need a game asset now. I'll be using Maya to create the geometry for this. This will be rigged and textured eventually too. We need something that follows the main player at an equal pace. So this gives us an idea about size. I'm thinking one quarter to one third scale, kind of like a dog. It needs to pick up and fly for additive firepower when the player needs it. It's a great time to discuss this with a concept team to get some ideas locked in, but in this expedited form, maybe I can just get straight into it. We can go down the rabbit hole of ideas now. Roombas, drones, drones with quad blade versus opposing blade designs, kind of like the Mars helicopter. Insects, scorpions, jumping spiders, battle bots. I can imagine anything here. I can pull references virtually anywhere to make something cool. It needs to be compact, agile. A fold-out function for the blades would be super neat. It'd be cool to have it jump and walk like a spider too. So mechanical functionality is a must. Wheels or tracks would only make it heavy. We can think a little like an engineer without the pressure of being one. Once we lock in a design, I can send this around the floor to motivate the crew. It's nice to have everyone on board with the idea. Now to give Simon the head start, I'll provide him with proxy geometry. Uh, this is sort of like dummy geometry. So he has the proportions and sizes needed to complete the rig and animation. While he's working on that, I will build the final model, including all knuckles, hydraulics, and pivots that I can imagine would mechanically function properly in real life. Paying attention to the robot's kinematics is essential. Thanks, Alex. So for intro to real time, we talk about animation and rigging in a game engine environment and it applies to our game development production cycle. And in this case, while Alex is working on producing the final model for our character, we have built a proxy model that we use to help uh, visualize what our character is going to look like and what we're going to do with it. So with this mesh, we would assign some joints to it and prepare it for being able to animate with and then skin them. And not really worrying too much about the quality, just giving us something to start with so that we can visualize things. So once Alex is finished with the final model, we would bring it into the scene as a rigger and uh, compare the differences between the two meshes. We would check for making sure that the geometry is prepared in a way that's ideal for rigging and send any fixes back that's necessary. Uh, and then we would create a new set of joints, apply it as best we can to the new mesh and check for any issues when we're trying to do our skinning to uh, apply a good quality pass for our final mesh so that when things deform, we check to make sure it's gonna act properly. Otherwise we send those fixes back to the modelers to correct. So once we're kind of happy with this, we put it into the Unreal Engine again, apply a more final rig to it using some of the feedback we've gotten from the pre proxy uh, skeleton and the animation. So you can see here we built a few animations, uh, learning some mistakes from the past and applying some of the new features we have with this new updated mesh to see how things are going here. We've built a animation blueprint that's allowed us to see some random sequences so we can just play it in the level and see how the animations blend from one to the next in a you know fairly realistic uh, representation of what the game would be like. So once we've done some of these tests, we can pass these final assets over to Fierce so that he can begin uh, implementing them and putting them in the game. Hi, I'm Fierce Hassan the department head for the game programming course here at CG Spectrum. Whether you're on a large team or a small team, you're essentially going to be working in an IDE. On the screen here, you can see this is Visual Studio. There's also plenty other options. The important thing is that you have access to the source code. 
Generally, only the programmers or the software developers have access to the source code and can make modifications to existing tools or create new tools for animators, designers, modelers to work with to bring the game to life. In this example, Simon has put together an animation and Scott has asked for a feature. We're gonna bring this to life by taking that animation, plugging it in, and then giving Scott the tools to be able to tune it and make it work the way that he wants. So the request was to get this character that follows us around to be able to take a higher vantage point when combat starts. So here I've actually mapped the perception of gunshots as a threat and you can see when I fire, there it is. The AI takes a higher vantage point and can now, if there were enemies shooting at them, could be firing back. And as other feature requests come in, we can tackle those as well. While I work within the Unreal Engine, the main tunable parameters we provide are done through code. Here you can see the flight component was added in that a few variables were exposed. So that way the speed and the height could be tuned by design. Here you can see in the AI controller, there are new variables that are tied to the flight component that can be tuned to adjust the behavior. And so essentially that's the relationship. A feature request may come in and this is for AI and gameplay. There's also tools and engine programmers working together on a pipeline that allows the entire team to make a game shippable. Programmers are responsible for the low level work in the IDE, problem solving, figuring out what the needs the rest of the team are and writing the specific code. In our case, we use C++, you could use C Sharp, Python. The language isn't that important. What's important is the outcome. We teach C++ because that's the industry standard and we use Unreal Engine. Okay, thanks Ferris. So here we are back in the project. We now have our little buddy here. And Ferris tells me that the way this little guy works is that he will pop into flight mode when uh, I fire my weapon and try to help defend me. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pick this thing up and we're gonna run over here. Let's see if he follows me. Oh yeah, here we go. Yep, he knows how to follow me. We have a little problem with bad guys in that room. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to fire my weapon and see if he'll go into flight mode and then uh, we'll see how things work out. So let's, let's fire that. Oh, there he goes. Outstanding. Okay, so now he's in flight mode and he'll help defend me if uh, I go in there and get in the fight. So let's give that a try. And we win. Outstanding. There we have it. Hopefully this example gave you a better idea about what a game designer is, what a game programmer is, and a game artist, and all the different disciplines in a game. And it might give you an idea for where you might want to be and see for yourself what it's like to be a game designer, because it's an amazing job. And I know you're going to love it. Take care now.